Hi everyone, so my name is Chris and I, it's a pleasure to be here to give you a guest lecture. I wanted to focus my lecture because I know Claudia is uh, covering a whole range of different topics. I wanted to focus my guest lecture on challenges to implementing international conventions in the real world. I wanted to start my lecture by uh, recognising and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of this land, elders past, present and emerging, and future generations on which we hold this land in trust. Just briefly, my background, so I did science and law here at UQ and back in the 90s um, when probably before most of you guys were born, so then there were dinosaurs roamed the great court. We didn't have laptops, we had stone tablets and you had to take your notes by chipping them out. Chip, 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 chip. So you were very quick at note taking on stone. Uh, yeah, back in the 90s. So I did a science and law degree and then I worked for the Queensland Government in environmental enforcement for a couple of years. I uh, came back to uh, Brisbane uh, and did a Master in Laws and a PhD uh, and I started working as a barrister in 2000 and yeah, uh, back in 2010 I came back to UQ to teach for about six years. Uh, Claudia is now in that role teaching this course as well as a first semester course uh, EMBM 3103 and 7123 which is focused on environmental law effectively for domestic students, whereas this one is much more international. And now I'm back working as a barrister. So what I wanted to cover in this lecture was really three stories. I wanted to tell you three stories about implementing international law, um, but they relate to cases that I have worked on or am working on. So one case is about uh, killing flying foxes on a farm next to the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area. Uh, it was back in 2000 when I was new, a new graduate from UQ and new to working as a barrister. And after that, I want to tell you about a current case that I'm involved in uh, about groundwater extraction at Springbrook on the Gold Coast. And it, tomorrow, for those who are coming on the field trip, who's coming on the field trip? It's a great field trip, really fun. We go down to Springbrook and on the Springbrook field trip, I'm going to um, ask the bus to go first to look at this site that is the subject of this court case, which is uh, proposing to extract groundwater. And the concern that um, that raises is that it will impact on the surrounding World Heritage areas. So that's the second story I want to tell you about the Springbrook groundwater case. And then the third case I want to tell you about is, or tell you, it involves illegal logging up in Papua New Guinea. So I've been working for the last few years uh, for customary landholders in Papua New Guinea fighting illegal logging on their land. And I really wanted to bring that case in because it, sadly in many countries uh, corruption is such a impediment to implementing international agreements. Uh, it is in countries like PNG the, the lack of governance um, at a domestic level is just so sad to see and it's so difficult to actually get anything done for the community when your government isn't functioning. So PNG has all of these strong laws on paper for protecting the environment. They've got this fantastic constitution, some really strong environmental laws, but it falls down when the police are corrupt and government is corrupt and yeah. So illegal logging in Papua New Guinea was the third story I want to tell you. And the two take home points that I want to draw out of these stories are, are these. Firstly, that there's many practical challenges to implementing international conventions in the real world, including domestic politics and corruption. And secondly, that international law isn't just something that happens in faraway places like New York and Geneva, and it isn't just done by people like Barack Obama and, or Joe Biden uh, or you know, Vladimir Putin, you know, the world leaders, that there are the actual implementation of international environmental regulation is done by people like you and me on the ground in the 200 odd countries around the world. So the, the conventions like the World Heritage Convention or the Biodiversity Convention or any convention doesn't implement itself. There are all of these practical issues around achieving uh, the objects, the uh, obligations established under international law, including corruption and those sorts of practical governance issues. So 
uh, international law requires implementation at domestic and local levels, and it's often hard and complex. Complex scientifically, complex politically, complex, you know, from a whole range of different levels. So let's start with the first story. This story involves mass killing of flying foxes up in North Queensland. It comes from two decades ago, but it's, I've got some great footage and I just wanted to tell you about it. Uh, so it involved a fruit farm that had erected these big electric grids. So it was a lychee fruit farm, really big fruit farm. Um, you know, lychees, fantastic little fruits. Who, who here is a lychee lover? Okay, they, lychees should come. You know, like you get dolphin safe tuna or something, that lychees should come with a flying fox safe uh, label, which basically netting orchards is the way that farmers really should protect their um, orchards. Uh, but back two decades ago in North Queensland, farmers had developed this technique of so imagine all the trees are in rows, and down the rows they've erected poles, and along the poles, like telephone poles, they've um, run wire, so 15 wire um, sort of stacks that are electrified, and they hang there above the tree level, and the idea is that the flying foxes coming in at night uh, can't see the wires, collide with them, and basically create a circuit and are basically electrocuted to death. And electrocution is a really horrible death. It basically burns you internally. So a lot of animals are injured by it. Uh, a lot of, yeah, so there's a whole heap of horrible injuries as well as uh, animals that are killed. And this, the start of this story was um, a friend of mine, Carol Booth, um, contacted me in, it's about November 2000 and said that she had information she, she was living up in Townsville, so I'd been working up in Townsville for a couple of years before coming back to do my master in laws in Brisbane and get admitted as a barrister. And she contacted me and said she'd been told that this, there was a farm that was killing thousands of flying foxes. And um, she couldn't believe it, that, they, that one farm would be killing thousands of them. But she was going out to check it out, so me putting my lawyer's hat on, so she's going out to gather information about what was going on in the farm, so she was going to trespass. So me with my um, lawyer's hat on, you know, ethically you can't tell your you know, people to break the law. Um, so I'm saying, well, you know, I have to be very careful with that, Carol, you shouldn't be trespassing. Um, but if you do happen to get any, you know, um, evidence, you know, it'd be good to have a video. Um, so uh, try and record what you see. Uh, and what I'm going to play you now is some of the video footage that she took on the farm. So I'll just give you a warning, it's pretty horrible. There's lots of dead flying foxes. And so this is, and it's just sort of the raw uncut footage. So here is a dead flying fox hanging in the wires. And she's fo they focus in on it a bit. We're here and on then um, Bosworth's farm looking at the um this is just a fellow who was with um, Carol, um, basically saying, we're here on the Bosworth farm, we're looking at a dead bat on a wire. And basically they're going to show you in a moment the, you can see, um, yeah, this is looking down the lychee grids. So you can see the poles and you can't really see the wires, but you can see the black things. So those are dead flying foxes hanging in the wires. So they walked down the grids and they, they, they worked out that there were 6.4 kilometres of these grids on this farm, so 15 of these grids, 6.4 kilometres in total, killing, this is just you know, a dead, decaying bat. Um, so there were 6.4 kilometres, they were killing between 300 and 500 flying foxes a night over a six to eight week lychee season, which if the kill rate, would, so they went back for four nights, and if you assume that the sample they took was representative of the, uh, of the constant kill rate, then that would equate to something like 10 to 30,000 flying foxes in a lychee season. So the lychee season runs in November, December, January for about six to eight weeks. So 10 to 30,000. At the time, there was um, surveys of this species. So the species is a specialist to the surrounding rainforests. And so they would fly out of the surrounding rainforests, which were all national parks and world heritage areas, onto this private property where the farmers had sort of 
cleared rainforest and then planted these, this lychee crop and they were being exterminated on it as they came out. And you can see all these bats hanging up. Um, this is under night cam, so they're walking around a bit at night and you can see all the dead bats. Uh, they got a tip off, it was probably um, from um, a backpackers who <laughs> were horrified by what they said. Can you imagine, because the first job for the, like, the casual workers on this farm was to go out each morning and clear the dead bats up. Can you imagine like you've just arrived from Norway or, you know, or Canada, you're having you know, your backpacking holiday, you've got a you know, job picking fruit in North Queensland, you rock up this farm, hey, can you go and pick up all of these dead bats? And they threw them in a big pile out the back. And yeah, it's a pretty horrible job. Uh, here again under night cam. And we might get up to the point where there's one that's actually caught where it's being electrocuted and it screams. But you can just see lots of dead bats. So all of this was used in evidence in the court case. Uh, so they'd worked out there were 10 to 30,000 bats being killed. And that you can see the date, the 23rd of November um, 2000, so 20 years ago pretty well today. Uh, and uh, at the time, the surveys of this, these bats, which came out of the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area, estimated that the total population was about 100,000. So just think of that, this one farm was killing between 10 and 30,000 of a species that the total numbers are about 100,000 in the entire Wet Tropics. Uh, and, you know, these bats don't, they're not like insects that can just have like, you know, a thousand young each year. They have one to two young, they're slow to reproduce. So this one farm was pretty well wiping out the species, uh, along with a couple of other farms that also had these electric grids. Back in the 1990s, uh, they think that there might have been about 15 of these electric grids in North Queensland, and bat numbers went from millions down to about 100,000. Uh, and here's a dead bat. These are spectacle flying foxes. You can tell it's a spectacle flying fox because they're really distinctive. They've got gold around their back of their neck and they've got little gold tufts around their eyes. Um, so they actually look like they're wearing glasses or spectacles. And you can just see they're yeah, a dead, that's probably a dead young. So at this time of year, the mothers are often flying with the young that cling to their bodies. So imagine that, you know, flying, but you've got actually a young flying fox hanging onto you. So. Here's a dead, a freshly killed bat. And you can see the distinctive gold around its eyes. And so, yeah, a lot of young would be killed uh, if they weren't killed by the electric shock because their mothers are being electrocuted. So when, when the two, if you basically are electrocuted, like if you imagine the bat um, with its two arms, up to wings, the ele electricity passes through the body basically in one point and out and it burns everything along the way. So they suffer terrible internal burns. It can also cause cardiac arrest, but basically it burns you to death. So lots of them injured, so mothers that then wouldn't lactate, so you know their young's going to die, or the mother dies and the young then dies as well, basically from, would be from dehydration. Um, so here's a, you can see it's a freshly killed spectacle flying fox. They're really cool bats. They're quite big and they're very intelligent and yeah, they're awesome bats. So, so here's a um, young bat. You can see the mother's dead and the young is still alive. And so it's, yeah, quite, it's probably quite dehydrated. But that's an example of sort of the dual mortality with these things. So you're gonna see a little clip from Carol in a moment. So, you can't really hear that, but Carol's saying um, she found this flying fox. Um, she was actually a flying fox carer, so she picked it up um, and was taking it to um, uh, basically to rehabilitate it. And it was released back into the wild um, after it basically it had been rehabilitated. So, you can see it there needing a feed. This one will probably do quite well. Big and strong and assertive, as you can see. He's already had a feed. He's one of the lucky ones. Yep, so that's Carol. And I'll just play it until we see one being electrocuted. Um, so, under night cam again. You can see this. And then there's one just here where it gets electrocuted.
And notice it drops and falls away, so it probably died later from dehydration because it would have had terrible internal burns. And this is just them looking at the grids. I'm going to stop. It goes on for about 50 minutes. So we used all of that in uh, evidence in the court case. So here's a spectacle flying fox. Uh, as I said, it's, they've got gold around their eyes, so they look like they're wearing a pair of glasses. And um, they feed on nectar, uh, so they're vegetarians. Uh, they, so there's two big classes of bats. There's the big bats, the megachioptera, which basically are fruit eaters, but they eat not just fruit, they also eat nectar and um, pollen. So uh, here you can see this bat um, would be feeding on the nectar on this, these flowers. So just as you know, everyone knows the story about bees pollinating flowers, well birds and bats are also really important pollinators as well as some other um, you know, insects and other things. But you can, you can imagine what's happening here from a plant's perspective. So it's giving up a bit of nectar and this pollinator is coming along and as the flying fox moves around getting all the nectar, it's getting covered in pollen, then it flies to another plant uh, and all the pollen gets sort of spread around. So they are really important pollinators within the um, rainforest. A lot, of, a lot of trees depend on flying foxes particularly. So basically most trees that you see that have pungent flowers, so flying foxes um, have a similar hearing to us, um, but have really good sense of smell. So the classic sort of fruit that um, are, are um, pollinated or seed dispersed by flying foxes have pungent flowers and um, yeah, really they smell. So um, what are the sort of fruit do you think? A and they hang from trees. So think of, so lychees is a classic, uh, even though they're not endemic to Australia, uh, they are classic sort of flying fox um, food. They're hanging from trees, they're really smelly. What are the other things? They're in season at the moment, they're big, golden, delicious, Mangoes, classic flying fox food. Anything else? Pawpaw, paw, yeah. Parsnips. Parsnips, yeah. You can think of like a whole heap. But mangoes, lychees, they're classic flying fox foods. So even though they're not endemic to Australia, what farmers have done when they've cleared the rainforest and planted these um, lychee farms, it's basically like putting up like a supermarket for flying foxes. That's really ecologically, that's what it would look like to a flying fox because they'd be getting these smells coming and they'd be coming from miles around because it's like basically having a neon sight. Flying foxes come here, flying foxes come here. That's what the trees are saying because they want to be dispersed by the flying foxes. And so the flying foxes are just naturally flying in and then the farmers are just trying to exterminate them. So uh, that's a spectacle flying fox. And just for a few maps, so this is a, a picture of the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area. Um, Cairns is about here, so it stretches uh, all the way from um, Cookdown pretty well down to Townsville. And I'm going to focus in on that red circle. So focusing in here, again the yellow sort of outlines that you can see are the boundaries of the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area. And I'm going to focus in on that little red, well, where the red circle is. So this is the Carbol Hinchinbrook area. So basically what you can see there is the World Heritage Areas in yellow. The white areas that you can see here are all the lowland areas, because uh, in sort of classic um, sort of North Queensland um, landscape is uh, all of the lowlands were cleared decades ago for sugar cane. So all of that around Carbol, um, Hinchinbrook, Tully, it's all sugar cane in the lowlands. And all of the bits with, that were too steep um, for sugarcane were left and used as forestry and then that was turned over to National Park which became the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area in the 19, about 19, 1987 I think it was listed for its outstanding universal value in relation particularly to biodiversity. So basically you've got quite a disproportionate amount of hilly areas and that's quite common for protected areas around the world. The beautiful um, waterfalls and the like and mountains are commonly protected, included in protected areas around the world, but the lowland flat areas that are great for farming or houses are less protected because humans want them for other purposes. So that's similar here in North Queensland. So this lychee orchard, you can see where I've marked it with an arrow. So um, it's sort of between two bits of 
um, National Park and World Heritage Area. The eastern part is a coastal area that was um, protected um, through the efforts of a, uh, one particular guy at National Parks um, a couple of decades ago. So it's very important, Ed, um, it's Edmund Kennedy National Park. And um, on the um, western side or the left is also wet tropics. And you can see that the farm, which I'm going to focus in there on the, in the red circle, is right next to the boundary of the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area. In fact, it basically borders the Wet Tropics, but it's um, freehold or private land. It's not part of the Wet Tropics, but animals are coming out of the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area to feed on the lychees, and then they would fly back if they hadn't been killed. So it's a really big farm. The Wet Tropics was listed in 1988, uh, in inscribed on the World Heritage List, uh, it was included for all four criteria of outstanding universal significance, including that it contains the most important and significant habitats where threatened species of plants and animals of outstanding universal value from a point of view of science and conservation still survive. And the actual um, listing documents include this, uh, include a picture of a spectacle flying fox. I'm not sure if it was this one, but there's an actual picture in the listing documents of specs um, or spectacle flying foxes. They um, are important biodiversity in their own right, but they're also what you can regard as keystone species because they um, pollinate and disperse countless um, species of plants uh, in the wet tropics. So they're really, really important to keep them there. And if you lose them, then you potentially also over time will lose a lot of um, other biodiversity. So in terms of domestic laws, so at an international level, this area has been inscribed on the Wet Tropics World Heritage list, so Australia has accepted obligations, but to actually be implemented um, on the ground, it has to be incorporated into domestic law and then essentially enforced because, as you know, international agreements don't bind you and me or people like farmers. Uh, they bind countries like Australia, which accept an obligation to protect world heritage. So Australia's accepted that obligation, and one of the key things that the Australian National Government has done to try and protect World Heritage is to create an act called the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act in 1999. And one of the sections of that act, section 12, which says a person must not take an action that has or will have a significant impact on the world heritage values of a declared world heritage property, or is likely to have a significant impact on the world heritage values of a declared world heritage property. So that's what the law says, but it's actually got to be implemented. So Carol went to this property. She found that um, she gathered evidence of all these flying foxes being killed. She had the video evidence. She went off to the state regulator, <coughs> which was the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, which is still QPWS, and they have a law called the Nature Conservation Act, under which flying foxes are, at least in theory, protected. The QPWS responded, their inspector went out, and um, the farmers were supposed to have what was called a damage mitigation permit under that act to kill native animals to protect crops. They didn't have one. The inspector um, purported to issue the farmer, so in response to Carol's complaint about thousands of flying foxes being killed, an inspector went out and when the farmer basically said what was going on, the inspector purported to issue him with a retrospective permit to kill uh, 600 spectacle flying foxes and 300 rainbow lorikeets um, across the lychee season, like, and backdated it a month, which is how long the farmer had been killing in that season. Um, and Carol complained about that and said, well, I don't think you've even got power to issue a retrospective permit, but leave that to one side. You've only given him a permit for 600. He's killing that every night or every second night, and it's going on for weeks. You've got to take action to stop him. But QBWS refused to take any action. She also went to the federal government, the Department of, I think it was Environment Australia at that time, now Department of Environment and Water and whatever it is, um, the federal uh, environment department that regulated the Commonwealth laws, because as you know, we've got the national laws and state laws, national and state governments in Australia. So at a national level, the regulator also refused to take action. So the Queensland and Australian governments refused to take action to stop the culling. Why do you think that occurred? Any ideas? 
It didn't occur within the boundaries of the World Heritage Area. Let's have a look at the section at um, Commonwealth level. A person must not take an action that has a significant impact on the wet tropics World Heritage Area. So just think about this. It doesn't, it's not actually limited to within the World Heritage Area, it just has to have a significant impact. So if you're outside and you pollute um, a World Heritage Area, um, then you can be liable under this Act. This one, and let's just have a think about the numbers here. So we've got a species that's really important for the wet tropics in its own right and as a keystone species dispersing countless um, plants. So if you're basically, if you're killing 10 to 30,000 of a total population of 100,000, do you reckon that would be a significant impact? Significant just meaning an important impact. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be within the boundaries. Pretty bloody clearly an offence is going on here. The state laws are even clearer. You simply can't kill protected animals without a permit. So these guys, the damage mitigation permit didn't cover what they were killing, so that's clearly a breach at a state level as well. So clear breaches, no action. Why? Economic interest because of the farmers, bingo, that's exactly it. Um, and then that relates to what? Did you have want to add to that? Okay, so farming interests, so, um, and there's a word that comes into this, starts with P, second letter O, third letter L, politics. So politics comes into it. So regulators are often not just there implementing the laws in the public interest, uh, one of the huge problems we have in Australia is regulatory capture, which is the idea that re regulators often stop implementing their laws and start to protect the community, the people who are supposed to be regulated by it, they essentially become captured by those sectors. So regulatory capture is a huge problem with environmental law generally, um, including in Australia. So because of the politics, um, it's only very relatively recently that uh, well, I'll change that. Um, there's still a very strong um, belief by the agricultural um, sector in industry in Australia that they have a right to do whatever the hell they want on their land and any government that's going to come onto their land and tell them what to do can go and get stuffed. Um, so very strong political opposition to environmental laws regulating farmers and the politics stop the regulators taking action. Fortunately, uh, a lot of laws are now created which give power or standing to um, any person to go and enforce them. So Carol, being a very brave woman, uh, went off to the federal court and um, ran a case to stop the farmers um, operating the grids and it went to trial and um, we won. So Carol then went on to run a series of other cases. I was a barrister for her in the three cases that she ran. This is another case involving another lychee farm. Um, so there's Carol and here's a, a, a farmer um, standing in front of his electric grids. This is a third case and then here's a picture of when his grids were chopped down. He basically was forced by court orders to chop the grids down. So that's the base of them after they've been chopped and the grids lying on the ground. So Carol took three cases over a series of about four years um, to get these grids um, stopped and change government policy that they wouldn't approve them. Government still allows shooting of flying foxes by um, farmers, which is very difficult to regulate because uh, you just think about the workplace health and safety issues of you've given a permit to a farmer to shoot, you can't really send an inspector out to their farm in the middle of the night um, to go walk around and check what they're shooting um, without telling them. And of course, if you tell them, uh, are they going to sh you know, shoot any more than they're allowed? So basically, a shooting permit is a blank check to kill as many as they can. Um, and a lot of them get injured. Um, anyway, but at least shooting, it's more difficult to kill on large numbers than compared with these grids. So that is a story um, about it's domestic laws, but it was implementing international law at a domestic level. And I just wanted to draw a couple of lessons from that. Uh, firstly, that conserving biodiversity and world heritage, it isn't just about saving cute and cuddly animals, and it's not just about protected areas. Conserving biodiversity is hard, 
and that sometimes you need the courage and tenacity to fight long battles. Carol had to run a series of cases over about four or five years. She was a very um, amazing woman, very courageous. Just wanted to also flag, uh, Claude has no doubt already pointed out, there's so many overlaps between international conventions. Okay, I've been talking about World Heritage here, but this action would also be about implementing the Convention on Biological Diversity. Many uh, international treaties overlap in their operation. So the second story I wanted to tell you, won't be as long with this story, but it involves a current case in the Planning Environment Court here in Brisbane. And I was actually just in a conference about it this morning with solicitors and the client. Uh, it involves uh, extraction of groundwater. We're preparing for a trial that probably will occur in May next year uh, here in the Planning Environment Court in Brisbane. So just to give you some context, so here we are in Brisbane, UQ. Springbrook National Park is about an hour's drive south. So that's where we're going tomorrow for those that are coming on the field trip. We'll get in the bus. Um, just to flag, the, the bus tomorrow, remember, goes from UQ Lakes. So don't go to the main bus stop. We're going from UQ Lakes because that means we can get straight onto the Southeast Freeway and it saves us about half an hour each way. So UQ Lakes, we're going down to um, the Gold Coast, going up to the Springbrook um, hinterland, or Gold Coast hinterland at Springbrook. And um, here's just an image of one of the lookouts we'll go to, looking out uh, on Springbrook and this fantastic cliff line. Here's a class back in I think 2011 and one of the places we'll walk tomorrow where the walk actually goes behind a waterfall. And here's one of the students from 2014 from Malaysia, um, uh, Zan. She was a great, uh, yeah, one of the great students in this course in previous years. Here's uh, a picture taken by a student from, um, Philip was from Tanzania, I think. Um, and anyway, here was a picture he took looking out from the track that we walk along. So it's a really beautiful uh, area. Yeah, it's World Heritage, so it's going to be beautiful. Um, just to give you some context, so we're going to walk around Twin Falls, which is over here. Can you see that? And this map shows um, World Heritage is in the black cross hatching, um, and the, the green is National Park and then these blue areas are some proposed future special wildlife reserves which um, will be included hopefully in, in, dec in coming years in the World Heritage Area, but it's currently not in the World Heritage Area. So we're going to basically um, walk around Twin Falls uh, in this area. The court case that I'm involved in involves a site um, in the centre of this image. Can you see it just there? It's got those sort of three red and white dots. So on this land, the farmer, not the farmer, it's a land, landholder, um, has installed three big bores, groundwater bores, and uh, they want permission to extract groundwater at a commercial um, level, so about 16 million litres a year, to, and then they'll truck it down the hill to go to a brewery or something, so for bottled water. Um, so they're, they're taking groundwater from about 70 metres down and then um, driving it down the hill to, uh, yeah, for, for bottling. There's a couple of other existing groundwater operations on that road already. Um, the site is about a kilometre from Twin Falls, from the World Heritage Area, and there's also World Heritage Area to the west. Um, it's on a ridge line. Um, when you get down to um, sort of the plateau, um, there's a creek that runs down to Twin Falls. So this is about, the site is about a kilometre from the falls that we'll go to tomorrow and we'll also have a look at the site. So it's, it's outside the World Heritage Area but the concern is that it will impact on the World Heritage Area. So this area gets high rainfall in summer months. Uh, I doubt we'll get any rain um, tomorrow but it will probably be quite hot. But I've been there um, on many previous field trips where it's poured with rain and we've sort of sheltered under a cliff or something while the rain sort of buckets down. So bring uh, a rain jacket, I'd suggest. We mightn't use it, but it's better to be looking at it than looking for it. Um, so um, it gets high rainfall over summer, but then in winter it tends to not get a lot of rainfall. And it's particularly in the winter months 
when groundwater flowing from, uh, including from areas around this site, would be really important in the streams then flowing into the World Heritage Area. So the concern with this commercial water extraction is that it will impact on the surrounding World Heritage Areas. So that's the site and that sort of gives you a bit of context about where it is. So the, um, here's Twin Falls that we'll go to um, where we'll, I actually think this is where we'll have a swim. Yeah, so this is Twin Falls where we stop for lunch and I just grabbed a couple of screen grabs from um, some images done by my client, the Australian Rainforest Conservation Society. And what we were trying to show for the court in, in this top image is rainfall in December. So this is in the, the waterfall in the wet season. And you can see on the right is essentially the rainfall in the month before. So you can see big black bars. And all you can take from that is there's been plenty of rain in December in 2010 and then Here's the bottom image is September 2018, so it's in the dry season and much less rain in the month before. That's basically what this image is trying to show. Because we need to basic, often with court cases, it's important that you convey complex information visually, you know, for a judge who mightn't have any scientific background. So you're trying to communicate to them, hey, what's the significance of groundwater? So particularly we'd be saying that the bottom image is probably groundwater. Uh, that's what's actually trickling over the waterfall at that time. So if you extract a, a significant amount of groundwater in the catchment, then that is going to impact on the waterfall um, and including the ecology then, so the riparian vegetation. So the waterfall gives us a nice visual indicator of uh, what is the potential impacts of the um, development. And um, anyway, the issues in dispute I've just grabbed a, a, an image from, uh, there's a, a link that a lot of the documents are publicly available, uh, and the parties have been defining. So the applicant, the developer, applied for approval for what's called the material change of use to have commercial groundwater extraction on this land, and the local government refused it, and a number of other submitters uh, objected and became co-respondents. So I'm acting for a conservation group called the Australian Rainforest Conservation Society. And the issues in dispute are identified in a document which, in, which particularly includes impacts on groundwater and the ecology of the site and the surrounding areas. And the principal reference point is the local government planning scheme, which has a whole range of layers of protection for biodiversity but also for national parks and World Heritage Areas. So we're particularly looking at the local government planning scheme, but it brings in effectively World Heritage um, protection within the framework that's created under the State Government's Planning Act. So that's the legislation that we're involved in. It's actually the local government, so the State Government and the Federal Government aren't involved in it. So um, local government is a critical um, level of government for environmental planning and management in Queensland and that often involves um, yeah, international issues although often they won't recognise it you know but if you are if you're working for a local government say in the future and you are say you're here in Brisbane or Redlands and you've there's some coastal development and that you know they're looking to clear wetlands or the like then you know things like Ramsar, the Ramsar Convention other migratory species conventions, those are the sorts of things that can be relevant for you to consider. Uh, so yeah, local government uh, is an important decision maker in it. So groundwater and the impacts is a principal issue in dispute. The developer says there won't be any impacts, this is trivial in the context of the overall groundwater system that 16 megalitres a year won't even notice. Um, and then the experts for the other, the council and my client say, whoa, your data is so bad and your model is so bad. You can't even really tell what's going on here and um, this is, yeah, even with your deficiencies of information, there's you know, likely to be um, serious impacts. So then that sort of plays on to other experts, ecologists, and we've got groundwater, sorry, we've got World Heritage experts and town planners that then feed, you know, that it's the groundwater issues of the critical component and then it feeds into others. Complicated matter, it will probably be a trial of about seven days next May. Um, yeah, with a whole lot of experts involved. Okay, so that's the
the second story I wanted to tell you, and again, I just emphasise, you know, this is hard, it's complicated. Uh, it's not just... People might think, you know, protecting world heritage, who could disagree? But the dispute is often, particularly with landholders around it, they'll say, I'm not impacting on it. No one wants to be seen to be damaging world heritage, not normally anyway, but they'll say, we're not going to impact on it. And so the fight is between basically over the science, over what the impact will be. And it actually requires effort to get in and, and you know, be involved in the decision making process. You just can't curl up in a ball and you know, hope that it implements itself, it won't. Okay, so the third story I wanted to tell you brings in some different issues. And so we're gonna fly now from Australia to Papua New Guinea. This is me with um, Solicitor looking at her phone, um, a couple of uh, one of a colleagues of hers on the left um, from CELCOR, the Centre for Environmental Law and Community Rights in Papua New Guinea. Um, so th those two guys in green were, uh, were law students in PNG helping the solicitor who's looking at the phone. Um, the guy in blue at the back was um, our boatman sort of ferrying us around. So this was for a site visit I went on in 2008. So Papua New Guinea, as you know, um, big island. Um, off to the east of it, it's got a whole archipelago of islands um, going out through New Britain and New Hanover. And, sorry, um, yeah, New Ireland, sorry, New Britain, New Ireland, the big long islands. New Hanover is an island um, in that archipelago, so up in the top northeast of Papua New Guinea as a nation. So, um, PNG, um, yeah, very diverse, amazing country, over 800 languages spoken. Uh, the laws, though, are written in English uh, and based on the um, English common law system. Uh, it's got an amazing constitution, but for like an Australian lawyer like me, I can don't have to even speak the Tokpisin, the Pidgin English. Um, you can basically operate in English. So there's quite a few Queensland lawyers that do a lot of work in PNG. Um, so I can go into PNG and basically work because everything's in English. Uh, and so I've been involved because there's very little support for customary landholders. Um, there's plenty of people that will go in and work for the mining companies and the logging companies, but very few people that will actually go in and work for customary landholders because, hey, they can't pay you. So um, I've been working there for a few years. There's a huge amount of corruption um, and problems around, yeah, legal logging and other resources. This is just an extract from the findings of a commission of inquiry back in 2013 into these, these things that were called special agricultural and business leases that were set up a few decades ago to help, the idea was that they would help um, people develop their land for agriculture. In PNG, most of the land is still customary land, so there's no central registry of the land. Basically, people know where it is, but there's no maps or there's limited maps showing where people's different land is. And you can go and people will be able to tell you, that's my land, that's another clan's land. But actually writing it down and having a central record is quite difficult in a lot of places. So special agricultural and business leases were set up to allow a lease to be granted over land. It required landholders' consent. Uh, and if the landholders gave consent, then it basically would give um, a lease to go in and log the land and then establish something like a palm oil plantation or a rubber plantation or something like that. And then the idea was then that landholders would get employment and there'd be economic development. That was a theory. Um, SABLs, I've used the acronym, have been widely used for fraud. So, and what, how it basically typically works is um, a foreign corporation, um, not necessarily being critical of, well, typically there've been a lot of Malaysian loggers have gone in, um, companies operating go in, um, they basically pay a few locals um, to give consent to logging in an area, but in that area, like on the area we're looking at here on um, New Hanover, there's three SABLs being granted, and the one I'm particularly looking at is this one, portion 887C. Within that area, there is something like 10,000 customary landholders, 10,000. Um, 
they, in theory, under customary law, you should basically get everyone together for either a big meeting or a series of meetings, and you would need a vote of over 50% of the customary landholders to vote in favour of the proposal to develop the land. So in theory, you would need over 5,000 votes to actually get approval under customary law. Instead of that, they didn't do anything like that. They basically gave 100 kina to about six people. 100 kina is like $20 or so, it's like nothing. Um, who then gave their consent to logging on the land. So about, instead of 10,000, you got six who you've given 100 kina to who gave their consent. Then the company goes and lodges an application for an SABL, claims it has landholder consent. The government issues the SABL um, and the government in this case sent a land investigator. He knew that most people didn't know about it. Um, in this inquiry, um, it all came out. There was a, the um, government land investigator basically said uh, he knew he, a lot of people didn't know about it, but he signed off on that there'd been land, proper landholder consent anyway. So they issue this SABL with most people having no clue that this has been issued over their land. Then the loggers come along with police that they have, um, are paying. Um, so the police effectively get contracted out as hired security. Um, the police come with the loggers and you know they've got their bit of paper, the SABL, which says on paper that it's lawful for them to be there and there's been consent and they can log. And then they go into the area and any locals that object um, get locked up. So in another case that I'm involved in on Manus Island, um, one of my, we were just preparing to lodge a case, it's still being in preparation, and one of the clients had been objecting to logging. Um, about six weeks ago, police showed up at his door at 3 a.m. on a Saturday morning, um, banged on his door, dragged him out, tied him up with wire uh, in front of his family, dragged him off to the local logging camp where they waited until they got paid by the logging company and he had been arrested basically at the behest of the logging company uh, and then was dragged off to the police lockup and he was held for 10 days without charges until we could get him out. Um, and so we're currently in proceedings for damages for him for wrongful arrest. Um, but you know, that's what happens. Um, the police are not there you know, protecting the community. The police are there and paid by the logging companies um, and it is widespread. Um, so this court case started in 2014, still ongoing, terrible. Um, here's just focusing in on some of the damage that's been done. So extensive logging has occurred. So Metamin is um, up here, so I'm going to focus on that purple patch here. So the purple patch was deforestation from 2011 to 2016. Metamin is this um, village up here. I'm just going to show you a few images of this. So here's Metamin. And here's the Min River, which goes into the island. And you can see here all the logging areas and sneaking tracks where the loggers have been in. So here's, this is a report from Global Witness from 2017 about destroying the Min River and some of the crossings and the like. Here's some images from that report. So here's um, Metamin, and you can see the amount of erosion um, at the mouth of the river. Um, here is essentially part of the catchment in 2017 and I oh know 2014 you can see all forested and then by May 2015 basically all logged and here's just if you went out to Google Earth you could basically get this image of Metamin and you can see the Min River basically brown and the amount of sediment coming out so here's an image I took going in um, with one of our clients in the court case is um, the man in blue Peter Kouros going in up the Min River and going into Metamin which you can see in the distance and so here's Metamin, and the locals described how Met the Min River used to be clear and they could drink it, and it was a drinking water supply and they could fish in it, and because of the logging it now was shallow, brown, you couldn't drink it, so they've lost their annual water supply. Um, and basically looking at it, this I was there about three or four years after the logging occurred, and the catchment is, it'll be decades, it'll be generations, I think, before the actual river is back to being drinkable. So huge impacts on the local communities. Um, yeah, so here's just the next image I'm going to show you that sort of looks um, across that area looking down. You can just see this is a, um, about a, a year after the logging has occurred. So you can see things starting to go, go green again, looking out to the Min River, but huge areas cleared, going through all of the, like just no sediment erosion control, just 
logging tracks going everywhere through the forest, huge amount of erosion. This is the port where they would log, put the logs onto the um, ship, so they just basically bulldozed the mangroves and filled in a bay, um, and yeah, just destruction and waste logs everywhere. Here's an image I took of the ship. So the same ship goes around to different um, places, um, and yeah, um, and so typically it's um, uh, Malaysian companies or Malaysian owned Malaysian capital going in, registering companies in PNG, and then working with sort of locals, um, a few you know locals, um, and a lot of the timber gets sold to China. So here's a just an extract from a um, a. Um, report called Stain Trade by Global Witness in 2017. And so a lot of that timber goes from PNG, it goes to China, uh, it's turned into a lot of flooring. So next time you go to Bunnings, and you know, you'll, oh no, oh no, thank you. <laughs> it's so many products that, you know, we get on our, you know, on our shelves, um, are, you know, come from places like PNG. And on paper, the company, like Australia has got laws about controlling and legal logging and the like and imports and importers are supposed to be able to do due diligence about um, that the logs have come from a legal source. But on paper, this, these logs could actually be seen as lawful because they've got their bit of paper. It's not until you dig beneath, um, you know, we've got to get this, the approval set aside. Uh, at the moment, essentially, the logging on, on New Hanover, the, the, a company that was importing those what had become, you know, let's just say it's become flooring and they want to import it into Australia, you could probably show on a paper trail that this was actually lawful timber coming into Australia so you wouldn't get sort of red flags popping up for the imports of timber products from, you know, that had come from New Hanover coming into Australia or into the US. But the reality is really different because the reality is the corruption in the countries they're coming from means that, yeah. So the global links, um, around logging, uh, you know, which then brings in, you know, trade agreements and all those, those sorts of issues. It's really complicated and it's really hard and corruption is a huge impediment. Um, I remember a, a student of mine years ago from Colombia, um, after talking, you know, about a few days into the course, and she said, you know, Chris, it's, you know, great all these international agreements you're talking about, but, you know, back in my country, um, we might have signed up a to all of these things, but there's no way they can be implemented because um, because of the problems with the corruption we have. And that's not just Colombia, obviously many countries, uh, including PNG. So corruption, you know, we've got all these you know, international agreements that look good on paper, um, but actual implementation is hard. And that's, you know, even in a country like Australia that has, you know, a, a, a rich country, let alone in countries that are struggling economically. Okay, so to wrap up, uh, those are three stories. One about flying foxes, one about groundwater, um, both of them involving mainly World Heritage, and one about Papua New Guinea and illegal logging. Uh, the illegal logging one, you could say, well, in terms of international frameworks, the Convention on Biological Diversity would be a relevant framework there, but international trade laws are also, you know, one of the things that sort of get caught up in those sorts of issues because, you know, you've got extraction from countries um, going to other countries and then, you know, being transported all around the world. So trade law is an incredi incredibly important topic for international environmental regulation. So the take-home points, uh, as I said to start with, take-home points from these two lectures are this. There's a lot of practical challenges to implementing international conventions in the real world, including domestic politics and uh, corruption. And secondly, that international law just isn't something that happens in New York or Geneva. It happens all over. Um, implementing um, international agreements like the Convention on Biological Diversity, it's happening all around the world. And it involves people like you and me. Um, it involves domestic implementation at the local levels. And it's often hard and really complicated. And yeah, I hope that the things you, you guys are learning in this course, you know, if you're in Australia or you're going back to your countries that you know you're originally from, that you know what you learn in this course in your degrees is going to help you to achieve some great outcomes in the real world. It's hard, you know, your careers in this area are going to be challenging and yeah, difficult, but um, really valuable. 
that's the lecture. Um, does anyone have any questions?